in the writings of the old philosophers, one of the great questions addressed and virtually unanswered is, how is it that the neshama retains its ability to be able to remain in the guf by virtue of food? In other words, if a person didn't have food, eventually his soul would leave his body. But the soul isn't nourished through physical food. Yet on the other hand, there must be some connection between the mozain of the neshama and physical food. If not, how do you explain the linkage? Then how come the neshama shouldn't remain in the guf despite the guf's lack of nourishment? Many of the Mepharshi Atayra quote over here, the Rizal, it's discussed elaborately in the Sefer Shah Basarabim, and the Magan Avram also mentions it in Simon Samach Vav. The Rizal explains that everything in this world has a guf and a neshama. Not just the human body, as we know it, which obviously has a guf and a neshama. Everything in this world has a guf and a neshama. Whatever you look at has a physical form, and behind it there is a spiritual entity that gives its existence meaning. As a matter of fact, the Nebuchadnezzar Chaim explains that the succession of worlds, of Olamas or Yainim, from the Shemei HaShemayim down here until this world works with this process. The Nebuchadnezzar Chaim Olajana explains it. Down here on this world, you have a Guf and an Ashama. In the world above this world, which is much more spiritual, so, relatively speaking, what was a neshama down here becomes a guf. And there is a neshama to that guf on a much higher level. And as you ascend the ladder of heavenly realm, what is neshama in the lower world becomes guf in the higher world. Given the higher degree of spirituality, the lower form of spirituality assumes a physical form. And the Nefesh HaChaim is Mazbir, that this continues higher and higher and higher until Kav Yachol, the Rabbeinu Shalom himself, who is the Neshama for all sorts of life. Another way of putting this into perspective, Guf is something tangible, something that we can feel and touch. Neshama is the meaning of existence, but yet we have no direct way of sort of touching it. In regard to everything that exists on this world, there is the guf, which is the chelik hanigla, the revealed part, the outside part, the exterior form, the dimensions by which our senses can communicate with it and recognize it, and then there is the nefesh, the chelik hanister shabbat, the tnimius behind it. So when Moshe Rabbeinu was in Shemayim, and the Mulachim put forth the argument, why send the Torah down here to this world? What they meant to say was, as the Torah comes down here to this world, it has to assume somewhat of a Gashmiistic form. And you have a whole Perik and Shas about what happens when a cow is struck by an ox. Now that's Limud HaTorah. And that is all the Kedusha of Limud HaTorah. But it has to assume a Gashmiistic form relative to this world. Whereas if the Torah stays in Shemayim, so it assumes it's more spiritual level. So why take the Torah and put it into a physical form? So Moshe Rabbeinu counted by saying, You Malachim, you have the mitzvah of Kabbat of Zavicha Vesimecha, do you have a father or mother, do you have the Nisayan of not stealing, and so on. What was Moshe Rabbeinu's answer? Indeed, by taking the Torah down here to this world. So the Shemais of HaKadosh Baruch Hu assumed the Tariq mitzvahs as we understand them and know them, not to be jealous and not to steal and not to collect interest and so on. And in a way, you Malachim have a point. Why take the Torah and send it down from a spiritual degree into a Gash mystic form? But ultimately, Moshe Rabbeinu argued, which is a greater covet for the Bari Yaila. Us people down here who live only with the limitation of assessing things that are physical, and therefore, it requires great courage to fulfill the mitzvahs of the Torah, not to steal, not to cheat, not to collect interest, to honor our father and mother and all the Nisiyanis that go along with it. You, Malachim, don't have tests. You don't have an Asayan. 
Up here you see everything is clear. So of course you want to sing and serve Hashem. But the real coverage for the Divine Shalom is when a Yid struggles with his Amunah and withstands the darknesses and the difficulties and the trials and tribulations of everyday life. Then Abban also explains it this way. It's mashed that way from his Akdam Ma'ala because everyone asks the question, what would have been had Kairach not seen? What would have been had the Miraglim not seen? Of course, when we got the Torah, we got all the letters of the Torah, nothing was missing. My Shurabena was Makabal, everything on Hasinai. And the answer is, we would have had the very same letters, they would have represented things in a much higher realm. And as the Chatoim of the Dahamid were unfolded, so the Tziru, the Hiwaisis, tell us this story. But in these same letters, are the Torah that we will be zaycha to understand by learning the Pashtus of Torah down here that would have been there had they not sinned. The Rizal used to learn with the Talmud in every single Gemara six times throughout the entire week each time in a deeper way and on Shabbos he would reveal to them the Ruchni Yistika aspect of the Gemara. The, Kab- the Balatanya says there's a tremendous Mila in us being down here and having to learn the Torah in the form of what happens when the shark strikes the para, when the yak strikes the cow. When we learn the Torah down here and we struggle to understand how do you open a fire on Yom Tif or what do we do with our new stoves that have electronic clickers? By learning the Torah in its most gashmiistic form, we associate ourselves directly with the entire Torah, with the etzim will of the Rabbi Nishalayla, as opposed to the Malachi who in turn have the Torah in a more spiritual realm. Therefore, they are much more limited in what they can understand and what they can perceive without becoming bought to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's great presence. In other words, down here behind the sunglasses of the physical dimensions and manifestations of the Torah, we completely associate ourselves with the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The higher you go and the more spiritual it becomes, the less you can do that, because the Nivra would become bottle if he comes too close to the Bayre. So to quickly review, there are actually two Mailois that we have over the Malach. One is the fact that we don't see it, because we're limited to what we can physically perceive in terms of the dimensions of this world. Therefore, our Nisayin is greater, and we have the true Schar for serving Hashem. And the second thing is, because it's in a physical form, because it's sort of behind sunglasses, therefore, we can associate ourselves completely with the Ratan Abayra, through limit and fulfillment of his mitzvahs, something which Malachim can do only in a limited way. Now, the next time you walk outside and you're thinking about the things you heard over here, and you're walking on grass, take a look at that grass. That grass has a guf and a neshama. V'dvar Hashem shemayim nasu uveruach piv kal tzivah. In other words, when the Rabbi Yishalayim said, Yehi rakia, or Yehi ma'oyrois, or tatsha yoritz desha, so there was a kayach aliki that created this entity, whatever it is, that element of matter or of nature. And just like when the Rabbi Yishalayim said, Nasa adam, so the human being was created, the body of the human being was created, as well as the neshama. In every entity in this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the body as well as the neshama, which is the real meaning of its existence. And the only thing, anything you see exists, is because there are shamans of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that make it exist. Like the Medrash says, that for every grass in the world, there is a malach that says, grow, grow. That's its neshama, that's its ruchniya. Mehai Taima, you cannot take anything and make it non-existent. What we can do is we can take something and change its form. The Swarim explain. There's the Koyach Eish, Ruach, Mayim, Afar, the different elements of matter. And you can change something from Afar, from a solid entity, to Eish, to Afar. You can convert something from solid to gas. You can turn gases into liquids and liquids into gases. You can take something and break it up into trillions of tiny particles and spread it all over the seven continents. But what you cannot do is make it non-existent. 
you can only change its size and form. For that matter, we don't have the ability of creating a yesh miyayin. No one can create something out of nothing. We can take different elements of nature and rules of nature that already exist and apply it together and assemble it together and form it together in such a way that it now represents to our eyes a new thing that can do new things based on the combinations. But the ingredients, we cannot make anew. We can change things, but we can't make something out of nothing. Why? Because whatever exists down here in this world, we see its goof, we see its physical form, and behind there are the shame of Sagdash Shemar HaKadosh Baruch Hu's command that made it exist. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us in a world where he gave us the power to be able to change things, to manipulate the various different forms of nature, to combine them, to take them apart, which some people do for good and others do for bad. But because whatever exists is shameless of the Kaddish Baruch, Hu, the Kaddish Baruch Hu's command to make it exist, what you cannot do is you cannot make it non-existent. And for that matter, because it's Hashem's command, it is the Neshama, which is Hashem's command that makes something exist, we can create a new entity. And that's the aside behind Kabbalah. My see a shameless that effects various different changes in nature, but we won't go into that now, especially since we really don't understand it. But what we can do now is to explain how the result types of the Pasik, the famous Pasik, in this week's sense. Ki lo yalalechem levada yich yehada, man does not live on bread alone. Ki al komoitza pi Hashem yich yehada. Zak the Risa. When a person eats a piece of bread, two things are happening. That piece of bread is combined of a guf and an ashama. Your physical body, your digestive system, your gastric juices are going to take the physical piece of bread and they're going to break it down. By the same token, simultaneously, your neshama is absorbing the ruchnius of the bread, the neshama of the bread. The chalik hanistr of the bread, the dvar Hashem that makes it exist, goes to your neshama and the physical aspect goes to your body. The moitza pi Hashem, the neshama, in the piece of bread, in the sandwich, in whatever it is you are consuming, goes to your neshama. And thus, the intricate halachis of kashrus are directly related to this. For our neshama to be nourished properly, we have to adhere to all of the halachis of kashrus and the gedorim of chazal. Now, Lomaisa, with our bread, for the most part, what we see is the physical aspect of it, and the Nisham is hidden somewhere. With the Mun, it was exactly the opposite. For the most part, the Mun was Ruchnis. It assumed only as much a physical form as necessary to give it the possible dimensions for the human being to have the ability of taking hold of it, putting it into his mouth. But for the most part, it was Ruchnis. It was more neshama than it was gulf. And that's why those that weren't particularly interested in a stimulation of the neshama weren't that happy with the mom. And the, they complained about the mom. They referred to it as lechem akloikal. They said, we never have to relieve ourselves after eating the mom. The Baron Mein Chaim explained. The mom was mostly ruchnius. It was only a small physical dimension to it. So much so that there was nothing there even for the body to throw away as waste. Most of it was directed to the neshama. And for those who had memories of sitting down to a good steak for supper and enjoying only the physical aspect of it and burying the ruchnius behind it, this was not pleasing to them. Now the Svar Makdashim bring that making the proper bracha on food, and especially this is something to be stressed in this week's Sedra, the Yechalta, the Savata, the Rachta, the Shem Alekecha, proper bircha samaza, brings out the neshama aspect, notwithstanding any pleasure to the physical aspect, but it gives the neshama more out of the food. And thus, Chazal say, amongst the many virtues of a proper bircha samazin, a bircha samazin with kavana, a bircha samazin inside, a bircha samazin besimcha, is that it brings parnasa to the house, 
It brings a munna to the house. It brings faith to the house because your nasham is being nourished. The Katskar Ebuzachan of Racha pointed out how did Avram Avinu bring a munna to the world? He invited the people in. He said, Here, have a meal, have a drink in the desert. And then he forced them to bench. And if they didn't bench, they had to pay for it. He forced them to think, where is this food coming from? Who created this food? Who created the human body and its relationship to the nisham, its ability to survive, and so on? And from the physical nourishment, Avraham Avinu was able to elevate them to the ruchniyistic nourishment. So, Birchat HaMazayin represents a muna in the Rabbayin Shalaylam. If you bench properly, then you will believe properly in the Rabbayin Shalaylam. So, interestingly enough, our parasha describes the person being full in one of two ways. In a positive way, and then in a negative way. Well, food can be either one. Can either direct the person to a muna in a kaddish baruch who is giving me the food, who is providing me, who is sustaining me, and as a net result, you become closer to a kaddish baruch or the food injects the koyach of gaiv into the guf. And when Gaiva sets in, the Kaddish Baruch Hu says, And as a result, the person forgets Hashem. It has exactly the opposite effect. So what signals the food to go in which direction? And the answer is Birchus HaMazin. A proper Birchus HaMazin is a conduit that directs enough nourishment to the Neshama so that the net result of eating brings a Yid to a Muna closer to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Where in the absence of a derchas amazayin, too much food goes to the guf, and as a result, it's pent teichol v'savata v'ram levavecha v'shachach to Hashem alekecha. The truth is, it's sort of all connected. If a person washes properly, if it's proper until he dies, so he eats properly and he benches properly. And if you don't eat like a yid, then you don't wind up benching properly. It's just the way it is. Thus, the shloim of kolin tights the pasuk to give you a chal to the savata v'irachta. Fill yourself up with the bracha. If you eat properly, what you're going to remain full with, what you'll feel, is the bracha. And you'll be a better person as a result of it. A chassid once came to the Sadegei Rebbe and said that he's losing his feeling for davening and learning. And the Sadegei Rebbe asked him for his schedule. When he told him his schedule, he realized that he only ate one meal a day in the morning and ate nothing at night. So the Rebbe told him, that's a nice he ate. In the morning, there's so many mitzvahs between sitzes and tefillin and davening. At night, the person is much more vulnerable to the Yetzirah. But if you make a point of not shying away from the food, but eating properly, and you have all the mitzvahs of Nitoth, you die in the of and so on, then you have a full stomach to fight off the Yetzirah at night as well. A Yid told me that Rebbein Kotler Zecher Tzadik Levracha once took him into his room, and he showed him in a closet a special pair of shoes. And he said to me, you should know that these shoes are very precious to me. As a matter of fact, whenever I have a difficult situation in life and I want to be misfowl, I open the closet and I'm misfowl next to these shoes. What was the significance of those shoes? Well, it turns out, in the yeshiva of Yisra Zaman Nelser, in Europe, before he came to Yerushalayim, when World War I broke out, World War I, of course, was going to be the war that's going to end all wars, Everything began to break down. Society broke down. The whole infrastructure broke down. And to say that things were uncertain was an understatement. So Rabbi Zalman told his Talmudim, he said, under these circumstances where we have to flee for our lives at a moment's notice, I can't keep you. Everyone has to return home. So the Talmudim all returned home. And one particular Talmud, who is today one of the famous Rashi HaYeshiva, walked home. It was an extremely difficult walk. The streets were packed with refugees, the roads full of people running in different directions, bombing raids overhead, all the trauma of war playing itself out and living horror in front of them. And this Talmud walks home. And the walk took many weeks. When he got home, he was happy to find out that his house was still standing. He knocked on the door, and his mother saw him and said, What are you doing here? She said, The Rosh Hashiva sent us all home. It's war. And the mother said, if it's war, then you belong in yeshiva more so than any other time. And the child argued with his mother. The child said, but ma, nothing is secure. We don't know what's happening. And she said to him, and here you're secure. Here in my house, I can protect you. This, this little roof is going to shelter you. If anything, 
Now, during a time like this, you have to be in yeshiva. You have to learn from morning until night. Please, I beg of you, my son, you know how I love you. And that's why I have to ask you, go back. So he turned around and he walked back. When he walked back, Mrs. Alma said to him, what are you doing here? How can you walk back during a time like this? So he told her what his mother said. And he told her, Mr. Zalman, he said, look, look at my shoes. They're so worn out. There's nothing left to them. But my mother just made it so simple that during a time of crisis and a, a time of uncertainty, the Gemara is the only certain place that I felt I had to walk back. I had the crisis to be able to walk back. And Mr. Zalman was so overwhelmed by the story that he went out and found a new pair of shoes for this Talmud that became a member of his household. And he said, these shoes... These worn-out shoes, I want them to stay with me for the rest of my life because they speak volume. They speak about the Amunah of a Yiddish Amama. They speak about Mesiris Nevesh Retire. They speak about the Tacha. And they speak about just an unbelievable courage. Please, I beg of you, the Mrs. Zalman said, let me keep these shoes. And he kept them in the bar and his son-in-law yarshin them. And to this day, they're used as something very special, sort of as a mocking to be mispowled around them. Looking at the shoes generates a certain kind of a moon and the serious navish. A sense of direction that we don't run the wrong way during times of uncertainty. The Mishnah in Kirkyovi says that you should roll in the dust by Talmud Chacham in the dust of their feet. And you should drink with thirst their words. Dr. Sanseifer, you have to understand what this Mishnah is saying. The Mishnah is saying that these two things are linked together. Someone who is Mesavik Ba'afar Aglaya and pushes himself into the environment of Erluch Yidn and Talmud Chacham and Sadiqim and does so with great mysterious nefesh for his children. Only such a person is Zaycha to be Shaisa B'Tzamas to Vayim to drink the words with thirst. If one is not ready for that mysterious nefesh, then you may hear the words, but you're not going to drink it like a thirsty person drinking water. It isn't going to be absorbed into your system that way. And that, says the Chsam Seifer, is the remnant in the Pasuk. Vahoya Ekev, in the schus of Dishasa Ekev, in the schus of the ankle, walking, in the schus of mysterious nefesh, of Nedude Haderech, Lumokin Taira. Only in that schus, Tishmoin, are you going to be Zaycha to hear are you going to be zaycha to truly understand but there's another prerequisite as well Chazal tell us whenever a parasha begins with the lotion of Vayahi it always introduces an Indian of Tsar like Vayahi Bimeach HaShvelesh when a parasha begins with the lotion of the Haya, the Haya introduces an Indian of Simcha so Ekev despite the difficult journey that it sometimes takes to achieve finding the right place, finding the right mahalach, it has to be the simcha. At least on the outside. Now, you told me of someone who was a neighbor to the late simcha, Sechut Sadiq Lazacha, one of the previous Gedder Rebbe's, the father of today's Gedder Rebbe, Libadal Ben Chaim Lachaim. And the late simcha always used to greet him every single morning, even though he was only a simple person. As a matter of fact, he was a bacher then learning in the yeshiva. The Lev Simcha would always walk with an entourage of people, but somehow they were neighbors. Whenever they met each other, there was always a pleasant smile. And Adra, for whatever reason, they thought that the Rebbe was busy and he didn't have the proper greeting. The Lev Simcha would be Tevei from the Bachurim. Where's the good morning? So one morning, Shavasa Batamis, one of the Bachurim, passed the Rebbe and he said, Good morning. And then right away he said, Oh, maybe today, Shavasa Batamis, it's not proper to greet someone. Even though al the Yisra is only on Tisha B'av, but perhaps Shavas of the time is we should display more so our feeling of Tsar and Chord in the beginning of the three weeks. So the Lev Simcha answer, that's all true. But in his eye, on the inside, not on the outside. You need the Bali Musra say the face of a person is a Rishus it's a public domain. Now, do you have permission to take your garbage or extra boxes or problems and just leave it on the street for people to trip over or to get depressed when they pass by? If it's your difficulty, whatever the problem is, you have to find a way to deal with it. If there's a problem, there's a solution. But you can't dump it on the street. A person's face is a Rosh Hashanah. You're worried? You're concerned? 
On the outside, you smile. Why depress others? Why make others sad? Well, sometimes you have to warn others of an impending danger. But in terms of dealing with the difficulties of life, so the Chayvah of Avos tells us how it's supposed to be done. In the Shah Prishos Perik Dawas, quote, Midas HaChasidim V'HaPirushim, HaParush, someone who wants to be totally separated from this world, Sahalosoy B'Fonov, joy on his face, V'Avilosoy, his mourning believed by in his heart. It doesn't mean depression in his heart, it means the seriousness that's kept in his heart. And the Mar Shamish says in this week's Pasha that this is the greatest yesoid to breaking difficult zeros. Simcha on the outside, ki ein hatsos lefnei hamokoyim lois v'chedza b'mkoyimayin on the inside of heart is nishbar ashnei moser kiroyim. Full of tshuva and yerushamayim. Again, not depression. There's no place for depression not on the outside, not on the inside. The Varen of Colleen said, that depression is no avera, but what access can lead to, no other avera can lead to. On the other hand, seriousness, a heart full of your shamayim, a realization of the need to do tshuva, all of that necessary, but necessary on the inside. And tzaddikim who do that, who maintain the smile on the outside and the tshuva and the your shamayim inside, they can be mevatal ulbik zeres and dinim. They can be mamtik the dinim b'sharashim. They can sweeten the din at their source. The Hoya is the Lashon of Simcha. Ekev, on the other hand, is the Lashon of Anav, the Lashon of Shiflos, the ankle all the way at the bottom. This is the Madrega of Tzadikim. Simcha the Chazer B'fanav and the Yir and Tshuva B'libay. And with this type of an attitude, with this type of a display, Tishmu is a Mishpatim Elam. Tishmu, he says, is the Lashon of Asif, a Lashon of Gathering. When Shaul wanted to gather the people together and encourage them for the very first time since the days of Yeshua, that all of Klal Yisrael joined as one unit to battle the enemy, that an attack against one Yid is an attack against all Yidin. So the Lashon of the Pasuk is by Yeshama Shaul Esa'am. Shama, from the Lashon of hearing, or even more so, true hearing means understanding. When you didn't understand that we're one unit, then automatically everyone is gathered together. It's a spontaneous response. So we hire if there is simcha, and there is akiv, and there is yerushamayim in the heart. Then, you're at tzaddik. Then you have the kayach to gather others, to be ma'ayur them for tshuva. Then tishma'un. Yishamatam v'yafisa ma'isa. Yishamatam, you will be able through this attitude to trigger a shmira, a protection on the people that are under your influence, and the Yassi Samay Sam, you will be massacring it, sweeten it, turn those bad Xeris into good Xeris. The only thing is, it's easier said than done. It's easier to tell someone else to smile when he's facing a difficult situation. It's much harder to smile yourself. Well, there's encouragement over here in the Pasig as well. The last words of Pasha the Yassan and Finnish Rashi explains, Today, meaning down here in this world, is the time to do mitzvahs, to perform the mitzvahs. And the reward for mitzvahs comes afterwards. The Gemara says in Masech the Tzachim, And amongst them, Torah, Tshuva, Gan Eden. So if the Torah was created, explains the Marvashamish prior to the world, so it must be so much greater than the world. In other words, the Torah that we're zaycha to learn, the mitzvahs that we are zaycha to be mekayim, are just the me'en of the blueprint. The ability to understand down here is so little compared to what there is to understand. However, this is the way it works, says the Mar Shamish, and many others as well explain this. When a person does his best down here, and he uses whatever kaychas HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him to understand, to learn, to use his time efficiently, to apply himself for Torah and Mitzvahs to the best of his ability, then when he comes to Gan Eden, they are Megala to him, they reveal to him the real secrets, greater secrets, behind all of the Torah and the Mitzvahs and the Mice and Taibim that he learned. And that pleasure is undescribable. That is the pleasure of the Rishomis in Gan Eden. Chazal tell us, Asher Misha Bolakan, the Talmidai Biyadai. 
how fortunate is the person who comes up here, meaning to the world of Amos, the world of truth. And he has learning in his hands. He spent his time learning. Frederick Dessler, it should have said that Talmidai Beroishai or Talmidai in his seichel. What do you mean Talmidai Biyadai? Is our learning in our hands or is our learning in our minds? And the answer is mind. Well, no one has the same kind of mind. No one has the same level of IQ. One person has a great mind, another person has a struggle. And true, down here in this world, the people with the great minds are the ones that assume leadership positions. They're the ones that we have to rely on. We need them. We need their advice. That's how it comes Baruch structured it. But up there in the world of truth, it's, so it's a whole different world. It's actually Misha Balakam the Talmidai Biyadai, the hand, says of Desla. It doesn't measure ability. The hand measures hard work. How much was this person committing himself? The one who struggled down here, that Balabas, who was half alive and half asleep, who forced himself to that Dachayoni Shir at night, who spent all of his extra money instead of going on vacation to hire private rebellion for his children to push them to the right places in Moses despite his concerns about what's going to be with their physical well-being. This is the hand, not the mind. And that's what they reward for in Shemai. And it is to these hands that come with Tyre that they reveal the true secrets and great side of Tyre. The Balatanya says, don't feel bad if you struggle to understand something down here in this world and it doesn't go because for those who struggle down here, they're going to be privy to the real understanding of it when the time comes. The Marva Shamish says in this week's Pasha that that is the Iker Tainug, the Iker pleasure in Gan Eden for the Neshama Sakadashah. That the Kaddish Baruch is Megala to them, the Kaddish Baruch reveals to them the time they attire. And we find in the Zaira Kaddish, he says, that the Neshama used to reveal to the Tana, the Shinar Bayichai, many of the secrets of Taira that was taught to them in Gan Eden. And that was cause for great joy. Like we find by Adam Arishan prior to his chait, by Yenichayu began Eden, li avda ulashamra, chazal say li avda zu mitzvah saseh, ulashamra zu lois saseh, that before the chet said that, down here in this world he was like to those secrets of time. But now the neshamis, in the yoylam ha neshamis, are like to be mekayim, those mitzvahs, and to learn Taira in the way that Adam Arishan did before the Chet Eitzadah. And the more they struggle to be Mekayim, the little mitzvahs down here in this world, the Akev, as Rashi said, the mitzvahs show them dash biyakav, that people tend to step on, and the more there's Eichet to truly understand in the world of truth. And that explains the Marv is the connection between the Pasuk of last week's Pasha and the beginning of this week's Pasha. Last week's Pasha ended in Asher Anoichim at Ayayim. Rashi tells us, and right afterwards, Eiket. Eiket is Rashi Tevay. Eden, Kaidim, Bria. The Ganadin before Bria Suaylam. In other words, the real Schar is in Ganadin. And remember, the Fasi goes on. Over there, Tishmoin is on the you will truly understand. You'll be Zaycha to really understand. What you didn't understand in this world, why you had to perform mitzvahs under the most difficult circumstances. Up there, you are going to understand it. And that, and only that, will be the source of the greatest joy in Simcha. This world is a world of Simcha. A world where things are closed in. Where Kiyam and Mitzvah becomes difficult and becomes a greater struggle. And sometimes we think that we're sinking deeper and deeper in the mud and the bombs are falling on us and it's harder to make that trick to be Mechanach, our children, to learn, to daven properly. But bear in mind, you want to keep smiling on the outside when it's difficult to smile? And remember, Ushmatim the Asisa Maisa. Do it right down here. Do it to the best of your ability down here. Then you will be Zaycha Lishmar, the last of Tayo, like Adam Arisha and the Ganade and Kaidim And if you understand this and you're willing to try for this, then remember the Shamar Hashem, the Kachal Achar, the Brisa, the Chesed. In other words, even down here in this world, the Kabbalah will guard you. The way He promised your forefathers that you will be able to continue this path, to keep smiling on the outside in your performance of mitzvahs, and to keep that Yerushalayim in your heart. The Kabriner explained, Saif kol Saif, every single Yid has a tikkun. Ki lo yidach mimenu nidach. Ultimately, we each have to come back to our shayrish. And we have to accomplish what we were created for. And whether we do it in this Gilgal or in next Gilgal, Saif kol Saif, we have to do it. And Saif kol Saif, we're going to have to make amends for the things that we did wrong or for the time that we wasted. So the Pasuk is saying, look, the higher Akif Tishman, the end is going to be Akif from the Lashon of Saif. The bottom line is you're going to have to do what you have to do. 
Every single Yiddish in the Shema was created for a reason. There is something you can do that no one else in the world can. Varaya, you were created, says the Beis Aaron, because Baruch doesn't create things if they're not necessary. So that's where the parasha begins in the plural, Pashin Rabin, Tishmu'un, the Shemat and the Yathisim, and afterwards the rest of the parasha of Belosh and Yachim. Maish Rabbeinu is addressing Klal Yisrael, and he said, Klal Yisrael, each and every one of you has a mission. Klal Yisrael at large will survive. Every Yachid will come to his Shayrish, but not all at the same time. Here's where it branches out. But the bottom line is, Saif kol Saif ki yidach yidach. No one's going to be lost. Everyone's going to have to come back. Some people will do it the easy way. Some people only get the message after many times. So the Pasuk is sort of crying to us. The Hoya Ekev Tishman, the end is you're going to have to listen anyhow. Everyone has to come to his Shayrish. Everyone has to come back to the Messiah and what he has to. So why not do it with a smile? Why not do it with a It'll only make it easier for yourself and for all those around you. The Kartzka Rebbe said that when he was a child, he had made the following observation. The mikvah was once very, very hot. And a person walked in complaining. But finally, when he was in, he said, this is really Tam Gan Eden. And it took him a long time to come out. The Kartzka said he thought to himself that that is the difference between a mitzvah and an Avera. A mitzvah it's very difficult at the beginning. Sometimes it even hurts and burns. But when you get involved, then it is the most gishmaka thing. Then you can't have anything that is more tranquil, more relaxing. And Aveil is just the opposite. From the onset, it may be very, very sweet. But when you realize that you're inside, suddenly the everlasting feeling is one of exactly the opposite of sweetness or relaxation. So the issue is, says the Katska, what do you want to have at the beginning and what do you want to have as something sustained and lasts forever? That's the decision between Mitzvah and Aveira. A little bit of discomfort for a long, sustained, enjoyable life or the other way around. The Gemara of the Sechnes Brachas asks, how do you know that you have to bench after you eat? And the Gemara quotes the Pasuk, in our parish of Yechal Teve Savata, the Rechlet Hashem Alekecha. You will eat, you will feel satiated and full, you have to bench. The Gemara also asks, how do you know that you have to say Berchus HaTayra before you start learning? And the Gemara quotes the Pasuk, Yishem Hashem Ekra, Havu The problem is, what do I do with the X's and Y's, so to speak? The missing parts of the equation. How do you know that you have to make a bracha before you eat. For that, you don't have a pasuk. You only have a pasuk of yechal to the savata veirach, so that you have to bench after you eat. And how do we know by making a bracha on learning after you learn? And the Gemara's response is, you don't need a pasuk for those. It's a kalvachaim. When it comes to eating, we say it like this. Ma'adach, you have to make a bracha after you eat when you fall, if you have to bench Hashem. When you're feeling good about yourself, after a meal. So, of course, how much more so would you have to make a bracha before you start eating? It's a kal And when it comes to learning, we say, if you have to say bracha zetayah before you learn, so for sure afterwards. So without getting into the intricacies of that gemara, but the question has to be asked, why did the gemara assume automatically that when it comes to eating, the chiddush is that you have to bench afterwards? And of course, you have to bench before. Yet, when it comes to limit atayah, it's the reverse. The Chiddush is that you have to say Berchus before you start learning. And then I'll understand on my own, of course, afterwards. So it said the Shem de Gras basically what the Kaska gave us in his observation. When it comes to Hanas Oilam Hazeh, pleasures of this world, the Iker Hana is before you get it. A person has a taiva, he's mishtaikik, he can't wait, he can't wait for that new house to be built, he can't wait for that new piece of furniture to come. Whatever taiva it is, kosher a taiva. Usually, when it comes, it isn't as good as you anticipated. You make a hundred dollars before two seconds pass, you're already either worried, upset, or thinking how you can make the next hundred. How come we only made a hundred? Nothing ever looks as good as the picture on the box. It's always a disappointment when you take it out from the inside. That's human nature. Memela, we understand the Kavachayna. 
after you eat and you're full, usually you're not so much in the mood of benching Hashem. I mean, you already have it. The food is there already. The pastrami sandwich is never as good after you eat it as opposed to before you eat it. So if you have to bench after you eat, before you eat, when you still have the tithe and you're still looking forward to it, by Hanoi Sluchnius, it's exactly the opposite. Before you have it, you don't feel that much of a Mashiach, you're not pulled to it as much. You sit down to learn, it is difficult. The Yetzirah will make sure that the doorbell will ring, the phone will ring, a certain letter will come in the mail. He'll do everything to try to stop you. And then when you try to learn, your head droops down, you're tired, you try to engage in a chesed project, there are difficulties, people aren't cooperating with you. Instead of thank yous, you get tainas, you have every reason in the world to throw in the towel. It's not kishmat. But after you do it, after you perform it, if you break through and you're willing to absorb all the punches, and the stumbling blocks that inevitably the Yetzirah is going to place in front of you, then you feel a geshmak she'en kamayu. When you sit down and the words seem blurry and you blink your eyes again and again as many times as it takes and study and work and finally you understand the piece of Gemara, that is one of the sweetest feelings in the world. So therefore when it comes to Limud HaTayra, the Gemara assumes exactly the opposite. After learning, there's no Chiddush that you make a bracha. That's when you feel the sweetness. So if the Torah commands us to make a bracha before we start learning, before you have the Hana, so it's a Kavachaymer that after you learn, when you already feel the Hana, for sure, you have to bench Hashem. You're a Mechuyif to praise the Rabbi Nishalayim. The Mesha Chachma explains this a little bit differently. After a person eats, he is much more prone to sin than beforehand. What people say or what they do or what they think on a full stomach is not what they're going to do, say or think, on an empty stomach. The danger is when your stomach is full. So if the Torah commands us to make a bracha even after we're full, so it's a kavachimer. So I understand on my own for sure we should do so when we're in the proper state of mind and we have the hachna before eating. On the other hand, by limud ha-tayra, it's the other way around. The yikr sakan is before you start learning. Before a person engages and completely immerses himself in the limud, that's when he's too smart for himself. That's where there is a danger that the tayra, chas shalom as Rameir Simcha explains it, could be converted to a sam hamaves. But after a person truly tastes the sweetness of tayra and completely gets involved, he's a different person if he's learning properly. And therefore, if the Torah commands us to make the bracha before we start learning, before the Kiddush of HaTorah has taken its effect on your neshama, so it's a Kavachimer, surely after you start learning, you're much more in a state of mind to properly make a bracha. The Rosh Hashiva of Palm Hazanah always suggests if a person has an opportunity of learning as Dafa Yemishia in the morning before davening as opposed to the evening, there are many advantages to before davening. Your mind is clearer, the world is clearer still. But the great advantage is that your day is a different kind of a day if you learn a block Gemara before davening. Gemara, the Minichas Allah brings, is Rashi Tevais, Gavriel, Michal, the Soil, and Ariel, the Malachim. We mentioned this passage in our Nusach of Kriya Shema Lamita. We want to go to sleep with the Malachim protecting us. So the Nechot Salazar brings, I think, from the Chayza that a black Gemara before davening helps the Malachim carry your Tzilos, carries your Shachas up to Shemayim so your Tzilos can be accepted. And the Medrash Pinchas brings from the Pinchas Lakarta as important as it is to learn a black Gemara during the week before davening, it is even more so on Shabbos. The Katzke Rabbit said that a black Gemara before davening is metaher like a mikveh is. And in a sense, that's the Meshachach is saying. When it comes to limit attire, the Chiddush is that I can even make a bracha before I start learning. And if you can do that, so there's no question about making a bracha afterwards. Well, let's get back to the mitzvah in this week's parasha, and that is the Yechauta, the Savata, the Rachta, the Bench. The Chinuch 
Kach mekubal ani merabaisai. I have this Kabbalah for my rebbe. Yishmerein kale. Shekol hazahir be birchas hamazayin. One who is careful with birchas hamazayin. Mizanoisav mitzuyim loy bekavayit kol yamav. Then his food, his mezayinais, the things that he needs to sustain himself, will be made available to him in an honorable way all of his days. Birchas hamazayin. Besides her Birchas Atayra, is from the only brachas that are actually a diaraisa. We tend to forget that. We're all inspired when we pick up the first piece of matzah, the first night of Pesach, or when we hear the sound of the shaifer, or come into the sukkah or take that estrich. But on that same plateau, on that same level, is opening up the bencher and saying, Barachat Hashem, Lokeinu Melchoelam, Hazan Asakayel. Unlike other brachas, which are a preparation for the mitzvah, Birch HaSamazit is unique because it is the mitzvah. The mitzvah itself is the benching. And it is a mitzvah de'araisa. Yet we tend to treat it lightly. And I must confess this is true for myself as well. Sometimes by a Shabbos table, so we put a lot of emphasis at the beginning of the Suda. The Kiddush, everyone stands by attention. The Hamaitzi feeling, the inspired feeling, the uplifting feeling, especially Leil Shabbos Kaidesh, the Zmirais, the children come up with their Shilas, people say they're Devei Taira, and somehow, when it gets to benching, which is pushed off, after the fish, after the soup, after the chicken, after the kogo, after the fruit, and after the dessert, sometimes, things tend to peter out. The children are by now either sleeping, crying, or downstairs playing, and the grown-ups look at the clock and they say, Oh my, how late it is. And we grab the bencher and we zoom through. But this is the part of the meal that's the derisa. This is a mitzvah of same in And if we need a boost, well, let's bear in mind what the Chinuch tells us. Who wouldn't do any kind of a school to try to help us that our Mazayinah comes the Kavayit Kol Yamah? Rabbi Yaakov Kamenevsky Zuchayim Lebracha had a special nusach for benching, besides for the standard camp song that's used for benching. He had a special nusach, not a song, but a kind of a nusach, sort of a chant. And he was very mackbit for his children and grandchildren. If the children are going to run around during the meal, let them run around. You don't have to force them to sit out all the conversations, the boring conversations of the older people. But when the time comes for benching, patience, wait, put everyone into position and everyone sort of sing songs the benching slowly together often we bench on Shabbos and then we have the question when we finish did I say say or not if I didn't say say, I have to bench over but the truth is do you know what the real question is how come you don't remember if you said say or not the issue isn't the say as much as the issue is obviously you weren't thinking all that much about the words you were saying if you were concentrating on the benching, the chances are you would remember whether you said it say or not. But if you were saying the words externally, and in your mind you were already dreaming about wobbling up the stairs after that shult with a good maisa bichel, and lay down and get your sheen of the Shabbos timing, in all due respect, so that's why you don't remember whether you said it say or not. Stop and think for a moment. The issue isn't it say. The issue is benching. Was I concentrating on this mitzvah and say, dear I said, perhaps the most important part of the meal? Somebody once came to the close of the garage and he asked the Shiloh. Okay. He was standing there with his trilishal yad still on his arm. The Ritzuis, the straps part way around his arm and he's holding them and he's saying, Rebbe, I don't remember if I'm before davening and I'm putting it on or I'm after davening and I'm taking it off. So the Rebbe told him, I think regardless, you can daven over. Even if you did daven, if that's the question that you're asking, one can hardly call that davening. If you're not sure whether you said it say or not, you have to stop and think, even if I did say it say, is that called benching? The say for Yisad, the Shari Shuavai, the quotes, the Zayar Kaddish. The Zayar stresses the importance of benching dafka v'simcha. And the Zayar says it is not for naught that one is obligated to bench with a special joy, because that joy, that simcha, gives the kayach Whatever this means, we don't know, but it gives the kayach that the Rabbeinu Shalom is mashpia parnasa to people. That's the Lashon of the Zayi. Umeyahu chaydu, from this simcha, nasan milach mo'iladol. 
That is the Koyach Abracha that opens the channel of Parnoth. And from here we learn the Zayar goes on to say that a person who benches the way he is supposed to with a simcha and with a rotzayn halei is not just something that I have to get over with. So the Zayar, when he leaves this world, katzolik mehai alma. Now again, this is just for benching properly and benching besimcha. The Zayar says, asar itakon there is a special place that is fixed for him, that is prepared for him, goyrozin iloyin behechel in kadisha. Amongst the innermost secret chambers, holy chambers, Zakar il Barnash, how fortunate is this person, the Nata Pekude de More, who adheres, who guards the commands of his master, the Yoda Shvacha de Lahain, and he knows their proper praise. And the Yisad Bishar Shuavayde in Shar Zayin, Perik Tes, goes through the respective simple Kavanis for the different brachas of Birchus and the first bracha, the bracha on Mazainis, thanking Hashem for the man, for providing the man for Klaudi Sol in the Midbar, which in a sense, is the forerunner of our Parnassus throughout Gaulus. And he suggests that you wait a second or two between the first bracha and the next bracha. Let it sink in. Let the thank you bring out its full emotion within you before you forge on to the next bracha. The next bracha really should apply to us more so than at any other time. We know how perilous the situation in Eretz Yisrael is, how everything is unraveling, how Beder Chateva, nothing makes sense. And whether someone believes it or not, looking at the massive of Kral Yisrael on all sides and seeing what is happening on the ground, the facts on the ground cry out that there, there's only one Rabbi Yisrael on the world. There is no other. Have a mean of a solution, not politically, not militarily, not based on anything. And every year is rooted in Teretz Yisrael. Every year is a chilek in Teretz Yisrael that represents his kiyum. Thus, Rabbi Eliezer says, "Kol mishalei Omar Eretz Chemda Toiva Rechava Bevirchas Haaretz LaYatzi Yedechivasa." Again, something that we cannot take for granted, that we have to say slowly with kavana. The next bracha, the bracha of Rachim, the bracha of Bayne Yerushalayim. I mean, one's whole life is in this bracha. Free us of our tzaras, make us independent. The greatest blessing a person can possibly have. We shouldn't have to come on to Matnas Basa Vidam, the Yisad Vashay Shuavayda quotes a Zayra Kaddish, the one who truly feels the Tsar of the Churban at his Suda while he is eating, is Kiilu Bina Beise U Bina Koinun Chorbe de Bay Magdasha. Then you have the Brach of the Taizyanate, the Arachmans, and so on. And now perhaps some unscientific practical advice. It takes the average person anywhere between three to five minutes to really bench slowly and properly thinking about the words of each bracha like the Yisad V'Shay Shalavayda says stopping between each bracha for a second or two letting it absorb in so let's say four minutes most of the time when you bench you're in a rush you're finishing lunch you have to get back to work you're finishing breakfast you have to hop a bus as we said Shabbos by the Suda you're already wobbling up the stairs so perhaps more important than any other time take a look at your watch before you start benching. If it's 2.53, then say to yourself, I'm going to bench until 2.57, and if I finish before, penalty. I'm just going to sit here anyhow until 57. You'd be surprised. Slowly but surely, you'll start benching slower and with more kavan. It's sort of like the Rambam says, Kaisin I said, Shalom right, Sunny. Everybody wants to bench slowly. Everybody wants to daven with kavan. But sometimes... We claim that we don't have the patience. Our blood pressure doesn't allow it. But at the point that you know you're sitting here anyway, so the right sani and the neshama, the automatic reflex that is somewhere deep within us, which craves to bench to a Kaddish Baruch to be mamshach this Baruch and to do it besimcha, is going to take over. And what better week is there to be makabal this upon ourselves than the very week of the Pasuk of Yechata, the Savata, of the Rachta, and the Shem May the Rabbi Nishom help we should zaycha to bench, and to be benched. There is a mitzvah that we fulfill almost every single day of our lives. From our very young years in camp, we sing it with special joy, and all of our sodas and ice creams depend on it. We mark our bar mitzvahs and chasunas by printing special little booklets with benching. We know that when you say it besimcha, it brings parnasa to your home. And when you say it carefully, word by word, it opens up the door to all sorts of brachas. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu himself composed the first bracha as it corresponds to the man. We know that Yahushua 
gave us the words of the second bracha, Neidelacha, so he was the one that took us into Eretz Yisrael, and this bracha represents the love of Eretz Yisrael. We know that David and Shloyma were massacring the words of Rachem that lead up to Baine Yerushalayim, Baruch Atah Hashem, Baine Berachem of Yerushalayim, Amen, our whole hope, our whole security, everything that is dear to us somehow evolves around Yerushalayim, our whole future is there. When Kalal Yisrael thought that all was lost after the destruction of Beitar, and the Romans didn't even allow them to bury the dead bodies, eventually HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a nace and restored the hope and chizik and amunah to Kalal Yisrael. The bodies never decayed. Permission was given to bury them. And Chazal and Masak and Abracha of our native that is part of our benching. We have a whole series of Rachmans that really give us the key to all of life. So this mitzvah is so special to us, so dear to us, yet unfortunately for many of us, the way we fulfill the mitzvah on a day-to-day basis is in a haphazard manner, sometimes halfway in a siddur, halfway outside of the siddur. We're getting up from the table when we're halfway through, three-quarters through. Sometimes we have one sleeve in our coat, sometimes both sleeves in our coat, sometimes we have one foot out the door, sometimes both feet out the door while we are still benching. And sometimes we don't even want to wash because we have to bench. And it takes too much time. This is the Pasha of the Echalta, the Savata, of the Rachta, and Hashem And I would like to share with you a very sadistic Amesha Chachma that perhaps can change our attitude or wake us up a little bit to the importance of this mitzvah. The Mesha Chachma points out that the Gemara says in the Sechta's Brachas, Daf Menches Amid Beis. Tan Rabbanah. How do we know that Birchus HaMazim is Minat Taira? Because the Pasuk says, You will eat, you will be safe, and you will bench Hashem. So I only know that you have to bench Hashem after you eat. How do you know you also have to make a bracha? You have to make that Hamayt. How do you know you have to make a Shahakal, a Bari, a Bari, a Bari, a before you eat? Zak the Gemara Ahmed, I'll tell you, it's a Kalvachayimah. If you have to bench Hashem when you're full, surely when you're hungry you have to bench Hashem? When you're hungry, you have So even though the Kabbalah teaches us that you have to make a bracha before you eat, but Lamaisa, the Deraisa, points out the Meshachachma, the real mitzvah min ha-toyre is to bench Hashem after you eat, and we derive that there is also a halacha you're supposed to bench Hashem before. It's interesting that when it comes to birchah ha-toyre, it's exactly the opposite. Over here the Gemara says in the Sechah's brachas, how do we know that before you learn, when you wake up in the morning, you have to make bircha satayra, you have to make a bracha, shenema, because the Pasik says, Kishem Hashem Ekra, I will call out the name of Hashem, Havi Gaidil Elekein, come let us bring greatness to Hashem, let me expound, let me teach the world, let me pronounce the greatness of the Kaddish Baruch Hu so that it has an effect on me and on others. And the Gemara understands that this refers to the bracha that is said before you start learning. Amad of Yaisen, Mr. Yaisen, says, okay. So there's a bracha before you start learning. How do you know that there's a second bracha afterwards? That we know from a Kavachayim. Madach, when it comes to eating food, you make a bracha afterwards. And when it comes to tell you should for sure make a bracha afterwards. So this is interesting for the Meshachah. Let's contrast the two. When it comes to eating, the main derisa is that you make a bracha after you eat. And there's a Kavachayim there. There is a svarit, there is a rationale that we should also bench Hashem before you eat. When it comes to Birchas HaTayr, however, it's the other way around. The derisa is that you have to make that Birchas HaTayr before you start learning. And we derive from a Kavachayim that there's also an Indian of a Bracha after you learn. Why do we have over here the thrust of the derisa going in opposite directions, like the Meshachach? Why, when it comes to eating, is the main mitzvah the bracha after you eat, and why when it comes to learning, is, do we have a derisa only before you start learning? And agav, there's a subsequent bracha, a supplementary bracha afterwards. So the Meshachachma, the answer is simple. You just have to understand what the purpose of the bracha is. The bracha neutralizes the kayach hagashi, the kayach that rips the person away from a Kaddish Baruch in regard to the various different things in life. And there is such a kayach both when it comes to ruchnius, when it comes to limited Torah, as well as when it comes to gashmi, as well as when it comes to eating. Except that it takes effect on opposite sides. For example, when a person is hungry, he tends to be humble. 
And being humble brings the person closer to HaKadosh Baruch When you're full, you tend to be the opposite of humble. The more a person eats, the more complacent he becomes, the more he begins to dream about himself being a person of power, and the more he eats, the more he begins to dream that he is implementing that power, and you become further and further away from the Kodesh Baruch. The purpose of benching is to neutralize that, is to counter the negative effects that a full stomach can have on a person's psychic, and worse, on a person's Hashem. And the Pasuk makes it very clear, because right after the Pasuk teaches us the mitzvah of Birch HaSemach, and the Yechalte V'Shavata V'Yachta V'Shem Alekach HaLor HaTay V'Shem Alekach, so the Pasuk goes on to caution us, a little bit afterwards, and you will build goodly houses, and you will dwell in them. And things are going to start coming your way. Your herds and your flocks are going to multiply. The cast of Azov, and your silver and gold are going to be multiplied. And whatever you do is going to return very handsome investments. And as a result, there is a grave danger, the danger of the Ramul of Avecha, that your heart will be lifted up, the Shechachta, Hashem Alekecha, Metziach, and the Yerat Mitzrayim, Yidei Savadim, who took you to this great Nidra and protected you. In other words, whose survival you depend on. And if this goes really unchecked, then the worst is going to happen. What's going to happen is eventually, the amount of Bilba Vecha, you're going to say in your heart, Kaychi the Yaitzim Yadi, Asali Yisachai Alazah. My power and the might of my hand has gotten me all of this wealth. That is Chas Shalom what could happen when things begin to unravel that is what could happen if you don't bend or if you don't bend properly so yes of course it's important to make a bracha rishayna beforehand if a person eats without making a bracha rishayna he is considered a ganas stealing from the kabbiz baruch by not acknowledging that whatever he has is a gift from the kabbiz baruch but it's not as important as benching afterwards because here is where we really need that bracha samazan to ensure that the food in our stomach is a bracha to our mind and being an abchat to shalom occurs. On the other hand, when it comes to limit our Torah, explains the Neshachah, it's exactly the opposite. The great danger of limit our Torah is the attitude that you have before you start learning. If that attitude is wrong, then your whole limit our Torah is going to send you in the opposite direction of what it ought to. Chazal tell us, Zacha, if a person merits, Nasalai Sam Chayim, the Torah becomes the potion of life. Loi Zacha, if a person does not merit, then the Torah becomes Sam Hamavas, a poison. Father Chan Zacha used to tell me that Zacha is from the Russian of to be Mazaki yourself, or Shem Azai Zach, to clarify yourself. If a person cleanses himself properly before he starts to learn, then the Torah brings Chayim, it brings Amunna, to him and to the world around him. And it has only a positive effect on those who listen to his Divay Torah, and those who read his Divay Torah. When the Torah teaches us about learning Torah, it's the Limaritam Oisim as Benechem, it's teaching your children. Limud HaTorah in its greatest dagger is teaching Torah to others. It's interesting that Ben Oisim from the Yosef Rebbe points out a fascinating thing. Al Pi Halacha, if all you're doing is thinking in Divay Torah, you don't have to say Berchus HaTorah. The Zilna Gon holds that you do, but the Halacha we ask and a person is permitted to think in Divay Torah even before he actually recites the Berchus HaTorah. Preferably, he should say Berchus Torah beforehand, but he could think if you can't control yourself. The halach, however, we don't have that leniency when it comes to writing. In regard to writing the Torah, there are also various different sheets. If you can write the Torah before Berchus Torah, but Lamaisa, we pass in that you are not supposed to write down that Chiddush, that Gishmak of art that you heard, or that profound thought that you were enlightened with. You can't write that before you recite Berchus Torah for the day. Why? That's the Ben Lamaisa, because that's the Ikra Limit Torah. Where well, others can read it. They can't read your mind, but they can read your writing most of the time. So therefore, here is where you have to preface the limit of the Torah with the Kiddush of the Torah with Birch of the Torah. Now, the Mesachachma explains that just like by Birch of Samazan, the Birch of Samazan after the eating checks the negative effect of the eating, that it doesn't lead you to guide it, the Kaisa the Yaitz and the Birch of the Torah prior to learning checks your attitude. In other words, if a person learns with the wrong attitude, if a person learns with the objective of trying to show how great he is, or trying to break someone else up, or to catch the rub on a shila, or let me learn so I can catch that magatir, or let me learn, even though he's not consciously thinking about it, but subconsciously his learning is in the frame of mind where an I am a tamachacha. So-and-so is not. How dare he even come close to me? If that's just a fleeting thought in the back of his mind that negatively affects the whole effect that the Torah has on him. 
So therefore, Dr. Nesach Chachma is very positive. The bracha checks the negative influence or the danger of the respective thing that we're talking about. By Berchus HaMazayin, we need the bracha afterwards. By Berchus HaTayr, we need the bracha beforehand to make sure you are approaching the Sefer with the right attitude. If your Berchus HaTayr is right, then your words of Torah will have the right effect on others. It'll have a pleasant effect on others. It'll be the Derechel Dachi Noyam. If there is no Berchus HaTayr, or the Berchus HaTayr is not said properly, then your Torah is going to have a negative effect on us. People are going to look at you and say, who is that Balgaiva? He thinks he's so much better than me. And you're not going to cause them to want to listen to more Torah, you're going to push them away. Dr. Nefechach, the Mishnah says, Hako Chayavim Bezim. Everyone has to mention them. Kayhanim, Luzim, and Yisrael. And the Gemara asks, Kayhanim, why should I think Kayhanim don't have to bench? Answer the Gemara, well, being that Kayhanim are often eating kachim, they're eating karbonis, so I would think for that you don't have to bench. Therefore, the pastor has to stress the Yachalka, the Savarta, in Yesh Sazia, if you're full, you have to bench. It doesn't make a difference whether you're eating a tuna fish sandwich or you're a Kayan in the base of Migdash who is eating a carbon chakos or the parts of the carbon ashram that is permissible for him to eat that he's supposed to eat. The Nesachachim explains this so beautifully. What's the Havamin of the Gemara? What's the Maskana? What I would have thought of here, what the Gemara is trying to straighten us out on, is that I may have had the misconception that, look, you sit down to a tuna fish sandwich, you sit down to a turkey dinner, that can have a negative effect on you. That can lead to karsi vayt sinyadi, to gaiva, to forgetting the rabbi So you have to be careful to bench in order to cut that off. But the kayan, the kayan in the Vesa Migdash, who was eating from katsik kardashim, or he's eating from the kardashim kalim, the parts that only the kayan can eat, the elevated levels of kidusha, a kayan who's eating a carbon, which is a kapara for the bailam, which is kula ruchni, it's more ruchni than gashni is. I mean, there's no sakana that that's going to lead to gaiva. So I would think there's no reason for the kind to have to bench then. So Dr. Pasek, no, it doesn't work that way. If there is a physical pleasure, even if it's cut in, then there is a danger of gaiva. And the Master Chachman's point in cases, someone makes a man, he makes a vow that he will abstain from a certain well. So there's a rule, mitzvah is lav The purpose of mitzvah is not personal hana. And therefore, let's say in the middle of the winter when it's cold outside, if he wants to table himself in that well because he has a mitzvah of tefillah, he can. Ah, he made a nadir, he's going to abstain from the well. But technically, his nadir applies only to personal pleasure. And performing a mitzvah is not considered personal pleasure. However, in the summer when it's 95 degrees outside, with the heat factor of 110 degrees, and the humidity is very high, and he has a mitzvah to table himself, he cannot immerse himself in this well after he made a net that he's going to abstain from it. I is going to say, look, I'm performing a mitzvah. Indeed he is. But the fact is that there is a personal pleasure there. I'll never forget, there's an issue on Shabbos whether you can title yourself in a hot mitzvah or not. Many places can say it's also, it should not be hot. But the tzara hester is not getting into the halachic aspect of this. But those that are matirim say that there's a chilek between derech rechitza and derech tzila. Chazal asks to bathe in a hot water, but if you're titling yourself, just immersing yourself in or out, so even if the water is warm, then perhaps it's mortar. So I remember once there was a very hot mikvah someplace in the bungalow colony, the people were questioning whether they can go into it on Shabbos or not. And one person went in and he came right out, and someone said, ah, oh, it's derech tzila, it's mortar. And the man answered, look, I don't know derech tzila or derech rechitza, I know one thing that my back was killing me until now, and right now it feels great. You cannot separate the physical reality from the mitzvah. So the Havah, you know, was, look, the kain is eating kachim, he doesn't have to bench. And so the Gemara, no, it says, v'yachalka v'savata, if he is full, even though he's full with butter, touch him. But there is a danger of geyser, and therefore, yes, hakul chayof and bezimun, kaihanim levim the Yisraelim, even the kaihan. There's a beautiful beer on the bracha of the in the National Chachman, this is Pasha. We'll try to get into it a little bit. We'll discuss it more in the in Yaakov segment, the other Shemizah. Chazal was back in the fourth bracha of benching a Tavia native because of the Aruge Beita. Beita was the last hope to crush the Romans. Rabbi Akiva stood behind someone that he thought was Mashiach. It later turned out to be a disappointment. The Romans crushed the revolt. And the dead of Beita were not allowed to be buried. There was a cruel plan by the Romans in order to break the spirit of Klaus Eventually, on Chamishach Ba'av, permission was given to bury the dead of Beitah, and the dead never decayed. There was a great mess and a great physic for Klaus It showed Klaus that a Kaddish Baruch loves us even in Gaul. 
But it seems a bit odd that because of this one incident, one out of thousands of incidents that Klai Yisrael received chizik from the Kaddish Baruch and Gaulis, Chazal saw fit to institute a bracha that we say each and every time that we bench, enter the Nesach Chachma. The nest that happened in Beitah, that the dead didn't decay, that Chameshah Sabaav came and they were nitam l'kruh, it was not just an isolated nest. You have to understand that with the destruction of Beitah, Klai Yisrael thought they finished. How are they going to survive in Gaulis? Their last infrastructure was totally ripped apart and destroyed. We are set echad and shibim ze'edim. We are one lamb between seventy wolves. Listen to any news report, and you'll understand that. And here you had Rabbi Akiva, who thought that by was going to be Mashiach, he led the revolt that was based in daytime. It was such a disappointment. Manus Kali still thought that said, "We're not going to survive and go." And then a couple of years down the road. We survive. We're still around. Despite everything that suggests that we shouldn't. The Yerugay Beta is the symbol of the ultimate supposed demise of Klau Yisrael. It didn't turn out so bad. There's a great mess, a great miracle. Everyone saw it. Their bodies didn't decay. Their Neshami saw lies in Shemayin. The death down here in this world was just a transition into a better world. They were knitting the Kura. One Roman government had diabolical schemes to destroy and downgrade and take out every last drop of self-respect from Carl Yisrael, came along a Malchus right afterwards, that had a different attitude, that Kaddish Baruch Hu controls things, that Kaddish Baruch Hu only lets it go so far. And that's why you also make a, a bracha of a tzayda if you get a better wine by the name. Because the wine represents the Yisrael of drinking Yain Esach. The fact that we're so distinct and separate and so alone, and yet we survive, yet the Shechina is with us in Golis. Ubalabayis yoidei alihavki keila, the Kaddish Baruch Hu knows where he deposited his keila. The Shechina is with us. The wings of the Shechina and the cover of the Shemiz Bracha are with us so that when the Kaddish Bracha will restore his own honor, we are coming along. And that is the Bracha of Hatoi Ameta. And that is an idea that a person has to ingrain in himself every time he eats. Because it's all part of a formula that turns his food into a source of Bracha and not Chafash from the opposite. If I asked you to define the word now, how would you explain it? The answer is, the right way to answer the question is, it depends on the nigun, it depends on the context, it depends how it's used. It can have several connotations. For example, you see a little boy running out of the house, skipping toward his friends to play, and there's a little bit of a guilty look on his eyes. And then you see, a father, a father or you hear a mother yell from the window, Marshala, come back here right now. So you know what that now means. It means that there was something he should have done before, and he skipped over it to run to what he likes doing after, and he's being brought back to the present, whether he likes it or not. So that's a critical now. But listen to this now. A little boy is playing in the playroom with toys, and suddenly the mother yells in the other room, Marshall, come here quickly right now! That now could mean that there's a huge, big fire engine which the child simply adores and can't wait to see that's racing down the block. And if he misses the opportunity, he will not see it. Or, Bobby or Zadie are on the phone, about to take off to ask his phone. They want to say goodbye or hello to their child. Here it's not critical. Here it's something that the child is happy about, the mother is happy about, but the stress of now is to emphasize on the child there's no time to procrastinate. If you don't come now, you miss the opportunity. Fine. Then you can have someone giving a drasha or a chairman of the board by a board meeting, and he's rambling on and on, and finally he gets to one point in his statement or his speech, and he says, Now, listen to this. So in other words, what he means to say is everything he said until now is perhaps relatively insignificant. It was just a hagdama, a prelude to what he has to say, but now I need your focus. Now I need you to concentrate because of this is important. And here's a fourth possibility as to what the word now is emphasizing. Did you ever have a friend, a parent, a rabbi, or do you ever feel that you wind up saying, And now what am I asking you? So what am I asking you to do now already? To put your shoes away before you leave? To write me a letter? To make a phone call? So this now means something else altogether. It's also critical, but it's not in the form of an order. It's in the form of 
emphasizing your complaint. As if to say, you're rolling your eyes or you want to get away without doing it. Now, what am I asking you to do already? This now speaks volumes. This now is saying that I am asking you to do a little thing, which in your eyes is a big thing, just because you have to do it. But based on the occurrence, I tell you that you owe me, etc., etc., this now means who knows how many paragraphs. The Moshe Rabbeinu says to Klau Yisrael, the Atta Yisrael, and now Klau Yisrael, Ma Hashem Alekech Hashem Meimach, Kim Liyuras Hashem Alekech Alelechus B'chol Darach HaVelahava Isai, V'labadis Hashem Alekech B'chol Levavcha V'chol Nashecha, the Prophet after Chanishim, this, etc. How do we explain the word the Atta, and now? What does Moshe Rabbeinu mean to say to us when he says now? From Rashi, it is mashma. The, the atta is in the form of a loving the atta. Concentrate on what I'm saying. My Shabbana just finished talking about the Chet Egel. So you would think, after the terrible sin of the golden calf, HaKadosh Baruch is not interested in Klaal Yisrael anymore. Yet, my Shabbana's message to Klaal Yisrael and to us, for as we mentioned before, the whole Chumash Devarim is my Shabbana's parting words to every single year until Mashiach comes. That's what the Pasuk means when it says, That means to every year, to you and to me, because Meshur Rabbeinu saw all of us. HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Meshur Rabbeinu all the generations until Mashiach come. Meshur Rabbeinu is saying, you probably think that you've sinned so much, you've blundered so far away from Torah and Yerushalayim. You've destroyed your davening, your tefillah, your chesed. You had an Assyrian and you made up the next time you're going to overcome the Nisarian and you blew it again and again, by now, HaKadosh Baruch is probably not even interested in me. What's the point of me davening or learning? I've done so many of those, it's no use anyway. It won't accomplish anything. So my Shodainu says, look, I've just explained to you the terrible ramifications of the Chet Ego. But despite that, despite this horrific sin of Kralis for sinning Mamish Beger Chopa, now listen to this. HaKadosh Baruch Hu still says, what am I asking of you? Fear me. Try to serve me. Try to do mitzvahs. And I'll still accept you. Despite all the chatayim. Now, can you imagine this? After all you did, HaKadosh Baruch Hu still wants our avayda? On the word, Ki Yimli Yir, as Hashem Alekecha, Rashi reminds us, HaKol Medei Shemayin Chutz Mi Yir Shemayin. So here Rashi is explaining perhaps the word now from a different perspective. We think that we control our own destiny. We have it all figured out. We have our retirement plan. We have our pension plans. We know exactly what we're going to do. When we turn 60, we'll buy the condo in Florida. Or we're going to move to Muncie. We know exactly when our mortgage is going to be paid up 15 years, 30 years. We have it all planned out. We want to know exactly what we're doing and how we're going to do it for the next 20 years, for the next 30 years. We're all that way. But the reality is the way the world says, Mensch tracht in Gott lacht. You have nothing to do with where you're going to be for the next 20 years. The Rabbani Shalom decides that. Hakul Bideshemayim. Before a baby is born, that baby is shown everything. Where the baby is going to be born, where the baby will leave the world, the house the child is going to own, this person is going to own when he grows up. The job he's going to have, the family he's going to have, whom he's going to marry, it's all predestined. You think you're controlling it. The only thing you really control is a couple of crossroads called Tchira, three choice, of going toward Hashem or in the opposite direction. Across the emphasis, there are two kinds of Tchira. There's a Tchira that we live with 24-7, every moment of our life. person sets his alarm clock, does he wake up, say, my daani, wash negavasar, Go off to Davin on time, or does he set the snooze ten times and he misses Man Kriyashma? That's one kind of prayer. Person comes home for breakfast, he's in an angry mood, does he bench slowly and say a nice, cheerful good day to his family regardless, where the Chaydis of Abbas tells us to do? Or does he allow his inner frustration to cast the waves throughout the house and make everyone else feel bad and frightened and angry? All of that is prayer. But there's a different kind of prayer. There's a khira that comes through in the form of key decisions in life that either reflect our success in our mission for life or failure. You see, we're all here for a reason. And it could very well be that God explains this in the same way that a person can live here 70 years. 
for one day, for one moment where he has to make a decision one way or another. We don't know when the crossroad is. That's going to depict whether we passed or failed. We do know that whatever our mission is, Seth Kosef will have to fulfill it. Like Yaina. Yaina was given the mission to tell the people of Ninveh to do tshuva. He didn't like the mission, because if they do tshuva, he'll look like a fool. They're not going to believe him, but he warned them about the impending doom if they tried to run away. But it didn't help. Whether he allowed himself to be thrown into the water or was swallowed by a fish, Seth Kosef, he had to do what he had to do. Eliyah Yanavi performed Chiyas and on a child. You know who that child was? Was Yaina. That's what the Gemara says in Sanhedrin. It all teaches us the same lesson as playing the Chavot Chaim and the Sefer Sharitian. Whether the person leaves this world, whether he tries to run to the other side of the world, it doesn't help. First of all, you will have to do what you were created for. And there are pivotal points in your life where you make the decision, I am either succeeding or failing, and I'll have to do it again at a different time. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, look, you think you're in control of your own destiny. You think I'm asking all that much of you. I'm not asking anything of you. Because 99.9% of the things that happen in your life are going to happen regardless. You have nothing to do with it. Where you're going to live, where you're going to work. You think you control your own destiny. How much is going to be in your bank account tomorrow or in 10 years from now, it has nothing to do with you. Of course, you want to be responsible and try, but the bottom line is it has nothing to do with you. There are only those key decisions that you have to make, whether you're coming closer to Hashem or further away, where you have a clear and a free choice. So for after now, what is Hashem asking of you? Your career, your life, what you can dream of owning a nice home, it's nonsense. None of that is in your hands anyway. The only thing that's in your hands are the few important crossroads where you will decide whether you are on a path of or you're going in the opposite direction. And who knows, you may have to make the decision only once or twice in your life. So now, what am I asking you? I'm asking you to make one or two correct decisions. Anything else is in your hands anyway. But I want us to further explore the different meanings of the word viata. What about that first marshal, where the mother says, come here right now. Viata in the form of a command. I want to share with you an awesome mahalach that the Chalaz Chaim discusses in the Sefer Ahavaz Chesed, Terit Yud Aleph, in the footnotes. The Medjur says that the word Zi'ata means to do tshuva. In fact, the Chalaz Chaim, the Ata means now. Why is that tshuva? If anything, are the next words of the Pasuk, Ma Hashem, Alekach, Hashem, Machkim, Liyira. That's tshuva. Why is the word, and now, tshuva? Dr. Chalaz Chaim, what is the Iker Kayach of the Yetzirah? The Yetzirah's power is not in telling a Yid, don't do a mitzvah. Which Yid would listen to the Yetzirah if he says, don't do a mitzvah? The Yetzirah, for the most part, doesn't even try that, at least not at first. The modus operandi of the Yetzirah is, of course you're going to do the mitzvah. What's the Shaila? Tomorrow. That's his favorite word, tomorrow. Tomorrow you'll have time. Tomorrow you'll have the peace of mind. Tomorrow you won't be under such pressure to cover your checkbook. And of course he says the same thing to you tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, until there is no more tomorrow. Shlomo Melech says initially, don't say to your friend, go and come back tomorrow. You know who your friend means? You know who your friend refers to? He refers to your only friend you really have, your Yetzir type. A real friend is one who stands with him through difficult situations as well as the good ones. And we also love the Yachamev, the Yassim Shana, only your Yetzir type will be there when the going is going to get tough and difficult. Don't say to him, come back tomorrow. That's the Yetzirah's biggest trick, to keep him away. Dr. Chavit Chayim, Shemati, I heard B'Shem Goen Echad, who said that a person has to be Mashiach bin Avshah. You always have to imagine three things if you want to be successful in your Avdus Hashem. Number one, imagine that you only have one day to live. There's no tomorrow, I have one more day. Number two, Imagine that the Perik Mishnayis you're learning is the only Perik of Mishnayis in all of Shisha Sidra Mishnah. Or imagine that the Daf Gemara you're learning is the only Daf in all of Shas. Number three. Imagine that you are the only Yid in the world. It's you and the Rabbanish Shalom. And the Rabbanish Shalom says, here's my Torah, here's my Ratzayim, let's see if you fulfill it. Bear those three things in mind. And think how it's going to change your life. When do I start doing Shuvah? When do I start doing good deeds? I have to do it today. There is no tomorrow. 
If a person knew that this was his last day in the world, of course he would do everything within his power to give it his best by davening, by learning, by tzedakah. Now, if a person believed there was only one Perik Mishnayas in the world, of course he would learn it. Why not? I learned one Perik Mishnayas and I'm Baki Bechala Terakola. If a person knew there was only one daf in the world, of course he would learn it. He learns one daf, and then he's Baki in all the But because we say, ah, such a big shaft, I'll never learn it anyway. I'll never finish it anyway. So therefore we don't wind up learning that one daf. Shisha Siddhi Mishnah, it's so hard. I'll never finish it anyway. So therefore we don't learn the one parent. But if you can focus on one parent and say, this is the only parent in the world, this is the only daf in the world, we'll learn it. We've mentioned many times the story of a young man who came to Rabbi Freifel of Rechot Salik Levach and he said, I see so many Bachram finishing in the Sechtes and the Yeshiva makes a theme for them. The going is so tough for me, I'll never finish in the Sechtes. And he wanted to give up. So the Rosh Hashiva told him, come back tomorrow. And he came back tomorrow and the Rosh Hashiva handed him a Brachas Gemara. And he said to him, you make a theme on this Gemara, we will make you a party, the likings of which this Yeshiva has never seen. So he said, Rabbi, I can't. I know the Sechtes Brachas are 61 blot. The Rebbe said, open this Gemara. So he opens it to the first page, it's not base. He turns the next page, it's not base. He turns the next page, it's not base. The Rosh Hashiva gave him a Gemara with 61 blot, all not base. 61 copies of that days. Finish this and we'll make you a scene. For months, he learned that days again and again and again. Until he finished it 61 times. And when he finished that Gemara, they made a scene for him, the liking of which the Yeshiva had never seen. And this young man grew up to be a very great Talmud Chacham afterwards. There's only one daf. Think about it. I have no chesed to learn. I have no patience to listen to Shiurim. Only five minutes. There's only five minutes. There is no other time other than these five minutes. For five minutes, I could do it. Only one daf. Uh, one daf I can do. If you look at it that way, but these are the only five minutes in the world, or this is the only daf in the world, then you can do it. And you can do a lot more than you think you can do. And imagine you think you're the only year in the world. There's no other year. It's just you and a Kaddish Baruch If I do what I have to do, then the rest of Hashem has been fulfilled in this world, and the Bria comes to a Tachlis. If I don't, then the whole Bria, the whole Shesh is in a Bria, is for naught. How could I not do it? How could I be lax in my responsibility? That's because I'll say, the Shvili Nidro Island, the world was created for me. That doesn't mean that a person should have an attitude. Move over, give me Shlishi, the world was created for me. It means to say, in terms of responsibility, if I do what I have to do, then the whole world is Zaycha. And if I don't do what I have to do, the whole world loses. Bear these three things in mind, says the Chavetz Chaim, and your life will be different. And this is the meaning of the Yehavta Fashem Alekecha, B'chal Avavcha, B'chal Nafshcha, B'chal Niyadecha. Lofty ideal. B'chal Avavcha, with your Yetzatayv and your Yetzahara, B'chal Nafshcha, even if Hashem takes your Nefesh, B'chal Niyadecha, even if you have to lose all of your money, how can a person attain such level? And the answer is right there. Zak the Chavetz Chaim, Zahayu HaDevarim HaEila, Hashem Nechim Etzam Chayim Al Levavecha. You have all the messages over here. The three things you have to imagine. For how you had Vora Me'ela, these are the words. These words that you are learning now, these are the only words that exist. There are no other words other than Daf Beis or Daf Lamed Gimel or Daf Mem, whatever you're learning now. There's nothing else that exists. Asher Anoichi Mitzavcha, I am commanding you. It is between Hashem and you. There's no one else in the world. The pass or fail of the world depends on me. Hashem commanded me to do it. I can't rely on anyone else taking over. There's no one else in the world that can do what I can do. Like the Bessarion said, every Yid was created with a certain task, and there's no one else in the world that can do that same thing, the Haraya. Hashem created you. Hashem doesn't create things that are extra. If you can do what someone else can do, or someone else can do what you can do, Hashem wouldn't have made both of you. So it's a nice thing that Tzavcha has me and you. And the third thing is how you're in today. There is nothing else but today. There is no tomorrow. It's only a Kaddish Baruch Hu and Him. These are the three things that have to be placed on your heart. And that's what the Medrash means when the Medrash says, The Atta. The Atta. No Hashem Lekech Hashem Yimach. The word the Atta is the strongest message of Tshuva. Now. Stop what you're doing right now and put the whole world in the context of now. This black tomorrow that I'm learning now is the only black. 
This mitzvah that I'm about to do, I'm the only one in the world that can do it. This day is the only day that affords me the opportunity there is no tomorrow. Follow this pattern. And this is the Every decision you make, and he illustrates many examples, will be the correct one. The decision that brings you closer to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. This year is distributed by Koladas, 11 Stachemet Street, Yerushalayim. For donations, please call 02-538-3999. Fax 02-538-0267. Postbox 57035.